There are no borders when it comes to culture, when it comes to community. Using artwork is the best way of taking away las fronteras. Mexico is a crucible. We have been part of a larger picture since pre columbian times. I picked up a kind of honesty of work ethic from Mexico. It wasn't really about art. It was just about who they were and what they made. I see influences from Oaxaca in Los Angeles. One of them is Dia de Muertos. My Mexican heritage ties in with what I do today in the United States, making altars to carry on the tradition of remembering our ancestors. At the Textile Museum, we don't believe in strict borders. Every time we can, we try to cross cultures. And I said, I'm going to weave George Washington, and I can do it with feathers. I was hoping that in this very humble way to say something about openness to other cultures. And often it is art and artists who cross those borders and exchange way more easily than most. Culture is an evolving thing. And when you mix art into culture and artists into culture, then anything can happen. El arte es universal, porque no hay frontera. Major funding for Craft in America was provided by Cynthia Lovelace Sears and Frank Buxton. Lillian Pearson Lovelace. L.L. Brownrigg. The National Endowment for the Arts. Bloomberg Philanthropies. Stoleroff Foundation. Additional support was provided by the following. We all suffer three deaths. The first death is the day that we give our last breath, the day that we die. Our second death is the day that we are buried, never to be seen on the face of the earth again. And our third death, the most dreaded death of all, is to be forgotten. And that's why I do this. <laughs> The work that I do today is building altars for the other Los Muertos. How's that one? One of my friends coined this title on me, Altarista, so I've been called an Altarista all these years. An altar for me is a beautiful way of celebrating the dead. The process of remembering and gathering items for the altar. It's like a prayer, but it's also a release. Making flowers is a tradition in my family. My mother was quite talented artisan, and so I learned early. My mother came from a small village in Mexico, and she brought her traditions. She was very adamant actually for me to learn about my ancestors, my family. She really wanted me to carry on, not so much doing altars like I do today, but to carry on the tradition of remembering. And it ties in with what I do today with the other Los Muertos. Okay, yeah. For Day of the Dead, we don't celebrate death, we celebrate life. We invite the souls to come and visit us. I am making the arch or the arco. When we fill the archway with paper flowers, it becomes the doorway for the souls to find their way back to us. 
Look at how many hands have to go through and open up these flowers. Our energy that we pour into it becomes the drawing for our ancestors and our loved ones to find us. For Day of the Dead, we would go to the cemetery in the outskirts of East Los Angeles. My aunt and my mother would decorate an altar with something very simple, and then they would call us to come and eat the meal they had brought with them. I'm going to put this big one in the middle because it's too big. Okay. Dia de los Muertos was not celebrated publicly in a big party like it is today. This public celebration actually built, began at Self Help Graphics. Self Help Graphics was one of the very first organizations to ever celebrate Dia de, de los Muertos in earnest in the United States. Our Day of the Dead consisted of like 12 people, a few nuns and a few artists, and everybody brought a dish. I brought mole. I remember, I brought mole. The co-director there, Sister Karen Bocalero, who was an important person in my artistic life and in my personal life, wanted to have an event that would involve the community, where they could do art, where they could bring people to a cultural thing. The mission of Self-Help Graphics has always been to bring art into the community, to bring the community into art experience. This is what Sister Karen really believed, that art belonged to everyone. Sister Karen was definitely ahead of her time, and we were all a little bit crazy, so we went right along with her. <laughs> The artists and Sister Karen carved out almost a template that is now used all over the country. They took Dia de los Muertos from something that was very intimate, very familial, uh, and blew it up with the purpose of building community. Dia de los Muertos constantly evolves, and it's a reflection of the community as the Chicano identity has evolved, as the city of Los Angeles has evolved. Any sort of fusion or exchange of ideas. Um, I think it's so, it's so LA. I was born in East Los Angeles when I've lived here all my life. I have nine children. I was a school teacher for 28 years. My whole career was in my immediate community and I think I'm always a teacher. I think we could add a couple of these, like you added these, just to bring back this color. California was Mexico until 1849. Before that, it was the indigenous people. Here in Los Angeles, it was the Tongva people. It's important to know that history because many people who are here have not been recognized as part of this land. With Dia de los Muertos, you have, you know, obviously the Spanish Catholic influence, you have the indigenous Aztec influence, and then you have the remix that the Chicano community put on here. Chicano basically is Mexican born in the United States. I mean, that's literally what it is. But now the Chicano movement has also taken on Latinos of all, from all countries, from all backgrounds, from all histories. I would say that Chicanismo has a place for everyone. The way Chicanos and folks here on the east side celebrate Day of the Dead is different than the way it's celebrated in Mexico, but very much in line with the spiritual tradition of it. The biggest difference is access to the cemeteries at night. Here in the US, at sundown, they're closed. So that immediately kind of shifts the way you can celebrate it and how you celebrate it. We have been partnering with Grand Park to bring in artists, to bring in community organizations and individuals to create different altars. We, of course, always have our master altar maker artist, Ophelia Sparza, and so she'll make the large community altar that people can then contribute to on their own. How do you grow to be a master altar maker, right? Obviously, she was taught by her mother and that tradition's carried on in her family. Is there a sister Karen down there? but it takes a different shape when you're doing it amongst the public. It makes me feel good that the young people, they're actually really interested in it. When I was a kid, I didn't really grasp it, but now, you know, I, 
I, I see how important it is as far as where we come from, who we are. The Day of the Dead is celebrated two days. The first day is for kids and babies and pets who've passed away. The second day is for grown-ups who've passed away. It's, in, in Spanish, it's called De los Muertos. It's our way to connect to other communities. And sometimes it's the only time that we connect with these communities, but it's an important opportunity to do so. Her father passed away last year, and she said, huh, it would be neat to build one for my dad. So it's not in our direct cultural lineage, but I think it would be an interesting way to celebrate. I think it's a great to way to remember someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you help put my mother somewhere in the center? My grandmother would say they were with us because, look, the bread is drier. They suck the life out of it, and the water is a little lower. So you could see how we can't stop doing this. We can't. We have to keep the third death from ever occurring. We're sharing the other Los Muertos with the rest of the world, and the more we understand why we celebrate certain way. It gives you a whole insight about each other. Culture is an evolving thing. And when you mix art into culture and artists into culture, then anything goes. It's open. Anything can happen. We work with artists who are less concerned with physical walls and physical order spaces and more concerned with how their work affects communities. Finding ways to go above and beyond borders is something that we're very good at in this community. a los Estados Unidos. Primero hice una exhibición en 1968 en Luisiana y después en el Museo Metropolitano de Nueva York en el 70 y últimamente en el Mercado de Arte Folclórico Internacional de Santa Fe, Nuevo México. El arte es universal, por eso es que los artistas se unen porque no hay frontera. Mi especialidad es en diseños prehispánicos. Mi interés es de que la gente conozca los símbolos de nuestros antepasados. Estoy haciendo un diseño zapoteco que simboliza vida y muerte. Empieza en nada y termina en nada. Tengo ocho hijos y todos están conservando lo que es el trabajo de la artesanía. O sea, todos son tejedores, todos, hombres y mujeres. Mis hijas son los que se encargan de lavar la lana y el cardado también se encargan mis hijas. Cardar e hilar. Para obtener un buen hilo, Hay que lavarlo muy bien, que esté muy limpio y cardarlo muy bien. Es un trabajo lento. No es difícil, pero es muy lento, porque todo es hecho a mano. Y para tener, me encargo yo junto con mis hijos, porque ellos son los que se van a quedar en mi lugar. Lo, lo importante es los colores el índigo, el huizache, el muso de roca. Todos esos son colorantes muy buenos, muy permanentes. En las zonas arqueológicas de Monte Albán todavía se ven los rojos de cochinilla. Es un colorante prehispánico que todo mundo le gusta. Para nosotros, los zapotecos, el rojo de la cochinilla es el oro rojo. 
o es el rey de los colores. La cochinilla es el insecto parásito del nopal, que proviene del nopal. Es el único insecto que convierte el jugo del nopal, del nopal en ácido carmín. Ya nadie conocía la cochinilla en Oaxaca en el 1960. Pero gracias al maestro Rufino Tamayo, Francisco Toledo, fueron los pintores que me ayudaron para revivir los colorantes prehispánicos. El maestro Rufino Tamayo me traía cochinilla de Perú. Toledo me traía índigo de Niltepec, Oaxaca. Teotitlán, they have been a weaving community for millennia. And the Isaac Vasquez family are respected in Teotitlán and beyond Teotitlán for the work that Don Isaac has done. He took very seriously the task of relearning what had been lost because the weavers had been using synthetic dyes for a very long time. And he, by trial and error, by really working with the dye stuffs, came back to a mastery of cochineal, of all the hues that you can obtain. And in my opinion, he is the master dyer in Teotitlan, and his family continues with his tradition. Ahorita lo que estoy haciendo es moliendo la cochinilla. Se muele a base de metate para sacar el polvo, como lo pueden ver aquí. Ya una vez molido la cochinilla, se prepara el agua para pintar con cochinilla. Se le agrega el polvo de cochinilla en el agua y para fijar y lograr los tonos de rojos, se ocupa el jugo de limón. Este es el jugo de limón. Depende de la cantidad de limón, depende del tiempo del hervido, depende del color de la lana. Así se van logrando los diferentes tonos. Así se controla. Entonces se deja hervir de una a dos horas y después ya queda permanente, permanente. What was woven for the rural market, because these were worn as blankets by men in the Valley of Oaxaca and in the mountains beyond, made the transition to tapestries that are hung on walls or displayed on floors. In this transition, the weaving tradition has become enriched immensely. And people are now doing finer tapestry than was ever done, and they're much more experimental. Yo aprendí a tejer a la edad de ocho años con la ayuda de mi padre y de mi abuelo. Juntos ellos me enseñaban a tejer. Nosotros llevamos en la sangre toda esta bonita tradición porque es de por vida. We celebrate Dia de Muertos, and one of the traditions that they have here in Teotitlan is that from 3 p.m. when the spirits come and visit us, from that time, the bells keep ringing 24 hours. My father is from Teotitlan del Valle. I am half Zapotec, half Michoacana, and uh, since I was born in the United States, half American. I met Wilmer and we fell in love and we are planning to marry pretty soon here in Teotitlan. The Vasquez family celebrates Dia de Muertos. We buy in the market bread, flowers, fruit. Then we buy nuts, seeds, we make chocolate, and that's for the altar. Para preparar el altar, debemos de ponerle pan, frutas, las flores, cañas, las velas, veladora, agua. Las cañas 
es muy importante porque va formando un arco que eso representa la entrada de los muertos y salida de ellos también. Y también es la vela que usamos para la llegada de los difuntos. Es la luz que va alumbrando. María es mi esposa. Fue mi esposa porque ya murió. Este, los honramos porque ella es una persona muy importante en la familia. Fue este, una persona muy importante para mí porque me ayudó mucho. Así es la tradición de que vienen compadres, ahijados, eh, familiares cercanos. The belief is that Maria Vasquez comes and there must have mezcal, soda, and beer because that's what she loved to drink. If there's none of those things there, then something might happen, like a superstition. I do see influences from Oaxaca in Los Angeles. One of them is Dia de Muertos. They have the same food, same kind of altars, but here in Teotitlan, this is serious. This is not like a game. Dia de Muertos is a really, really heart-to-heart -heart celebration. Yo cuento con 82 años y tengo 70 años en este trabajo, pero Tengo ganas de seguir trabajando. Me gusta estar en el telar y yo creo que me moriré en el telar. Que en cada tapete siento eh, un poquito de mis manos, mi corazón y mi mente. Eso es lo que siento en los tapetes. Porque así solamente se puede tejer. Y no solamente con las manos, con la vista, con la cabeza y con los pies y con el corazón. Oaxaca became what it is today, a beautiful city with monumental architecture with beautiful gilded altars, with beautiful oil paintings in the churches and in the homes, all because of Cochinil. Alejandro de Avila, who is an artist, but also an anthropologist, was able to develop an ethnobotanical garden in Oaxaca. It shows off the variety of plants that do grow in the state of Oaxaca. To the sides, as you can see, we have the wild nopales with a lot of thorns. And then at the center, we have the cacti that were domesticated here as the host plants for cochineal. He began to identify the plants which were endangered within the state of Oaxaca. And it inspired me to do a series of tapestries based on these endangered species. Oaxaca is the region in Mesoamerica as a whole with the greatest diversity of materials for textiles, that is fibers and dye stuffs, the greatest diversity of techniques. Come and see, Jim. And the most diverse inventory of garments and textile design. So this is a four selvage web, Jim. He has turned the loom around and now he's working from this side. We have a 3,000 year record of how textiles have changed over time. And that is a unique in way into understanding human experience through textiles. Con el Dr. Alejandro estoy estoy aprendiendo bastante con él. Él me está enseñando muchas técnicas que ahorita ya no se ya no se trabajan. Siempre dejo una parte de mí en las piezas. Todo el tiempo le dedico todo de mí a las piezas. This is silk that has been raised for almost 500 years by indigenous communities, and this thread they dye using local plants. In addition to that silk that we have from the mountains, we have the feathered thread. 
Feathers have been very important in textile traditions in Mexico. Since the pre-Columbian times, feathers had a very special place. Only the elites would be authorized to wear feathers on their garments. There was a very active trade in feather garments, and probably because it's very labor intensive and very expensive, but eventually it disappeared. Francisco Toledo is our patron saint. He made it possible for us to propose the garden and to make it come true. And we also owe to him, in a large measure, what you see at the Textile Museum. Francisco Toledo purchased a collection of textiles. This collection had a fantastic ancient piece and one of the very few surviving examples of featherwork, a featherwork textile. There are some textiles in the Amazons, in South America, in the Pacific Islands, in the US even, that use feathers in their textiles, mm -hmm. but no culture uses this feather yarn. Yeah. So we, want, we were really eager and interested in replicating this and bringing it Yeah, that back is to a life. big difference, is it? I mean, to be using it in the structure of the cloth, mm -hmm. along with other things. Mm -hmm. It is only one of the six textiles that exist with that technique from that period. It was research, it was studied to find out how the down was dyed and how it was woven. We tried to replicate the technique and 10 years later, we, we are there. We are producing these beautiful textiles that nobody else has seen in 300 years. This was the very first feather textile that the museum acquired in 2008 after a workshop that we had to teach how we think the process was made. Magnificent. We are not only recovering something that was lost, we are also creating something completely new out of these materials. At the Textile Museum, we don't believe in strict borders. <laughs> and every time we can, we try to cross cultures. So for the exhibition, Hilar el Viento, to spin the wind, we invited different artists, not only from Oaxaca, but from other places. And Jim Basler was one of them. I was thinking, I'll probably be the only American in the show. And I said, that's it. I'm going to weave George Washington, because he has all that gorgeous white hair and I can do it with feathers. Almost all of the materials that I used came from Oaxaca, except the indigo blue linen. This is from a woman that I met in the market in 1970. It's hand-spun silk. She was spinning right on the street, and I bought as much as I could. I was really sort of worried about how I was going to get some sort of Caucasian George Washington's skin color. A dear friend of ours sent us the soundtrack from the musical Hamilton. And I thought, I will make my George black. And it gave me the opportunity to use natural brown cotton that I had picked up in a little weaving village in the Isthmus in 1972. And that really delighted me to think that since 1972, I'd held on to this natural brown cotton and was able to use it. So George came off looking. Uh, some people, when I told people what I was doing, they said, well, he doesn't look dark enough. And I said, well, that's the color of the natural brown cotton. I'm sorry. James Wedge weaves are fantastic. I love the creativity that he has achieved with these eccentric wefts. And the George Washington piece, for me, is a masterpiece. It synthesizes his last several years of working in that technique, but it's beyond skill. It reflects his deep philosophy of what the United States is about, what American culture is about, and what this current moment in American history is about. The mission of this space is to create a forum of exchange, of exchange of ideas, of designs, of experiences, 
um, to contrast cultures and find similarities, find those links among humans. And textiles reflect that. But borders always had the reference of the warp and the weft and the loom. You saw in what Noé was doing a four cell which textile. And that is valued. It is valued symbolically because it is an entire piece. And the borders play a crucial role because they're not cut borders, they're woven borders. They hold together. They have the value of being an entirety, an integrity. It's the way the loom is conceived. And I think it reflects an ideology that goes beyond weaving. It's an ideology of what is proper and what is complete and what is presentable and what is strong and steady and will hold. It will not unravel. Getso with a capital G is the gathering of indigenous people from the regions of Oaxaca. There's a sizable community of Oaxacanos in, in Los Angeles, and uh, happily, they want to keep these traditions alive even from this distance. Gurley and I met at UCLA, and we married in 1965. In 1967, we drove to Mexico City in order to see the new Anthropological Museum, which had just opened up. We looked at the map of Mexico, and there was the city of Oaxaca, which I mispronounced. And we said, I think that's supposed to be really good with folk art. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Mexico City, and I thought, oh, it's only three inches on the map. We can do it. It's a 12-hour trip. That was the beginning of a life-changing experience that we will never forget. And it has informed and influenced and impressed upon our life and our work ever since. As we drove, we went through about two or three different zones of indigenous people. Keep in mind, that Oaxaca, to this day, has 14 different indigenous groups living within the borders, and each one of those is expressed in the weavings that the women wear. <laughs> Drive up the coast, and you're approaching the state of Guerrero, and there's the Amuzco, which I am wearing today. And my huipil is one of the most complicated weavings that you will find. And this is from Chislahuaca, a town right inside the border of Guerrero. I was really trying to concentrate on what it was I was going to do for my master's degree. And it was from Oaxaca that I got the idea to do my project on natural dyes. I went out to the weaving village, Teotitlan de Valle, and it was amazing to me to see the sources that allowed them to have this wide range of color. I had my exhibit, and almost half of the show represented influences from the Oaxaca trip. In the late 1960s, we received an offer to continue a school in Oaxaca for teenage girls from the States. And it took about five minutes of discussion from Jim and me to come up with a resounding yes. <laughs> and we packed up our children and our two dogs and whatever we could fit in our Volkswagen bus and drove 3,000 miles to Oaxaca. It was the adventure that we were after. The emphasis was to introduce another culture to these young ladies. And that meant through song, through dance, through language, and of course, through 
going out to the villages to meet the people. I first visited Oaxaca when I was 15 years old. I lived with Verily and Jim. They were my art teachers, my life teachers. And as Verily says, you know, my adopted parents. The Oaxacania people invited me into their homes, into their lives, to understand their art, their music, their dance, and it changed my life. My complete worldview, Oaxaca did. Our status was always tourists, so every six months we had to leave Mexico. And so on all of these trips that we took, we would fill the car with folk art. There were not too many people who were willing to bring folk art back from southern Mexico. This is a puppet. You can see that mechanism, which is just kind of amazing. It's a very soft wood, and the man talks a lot. One time, I had taken along with me a Time magazine, which had a two-page spread in the middle of it, and its caption was, man has a need for color. And on it was a wooden animal. And we asked in the craft shop, who did this? And they directed us out to a little village, Arasola, to Manuel Jimenez. He was indeed an exceptional folk artist. This is really an amazing piece. He didn't often do muertos. He did a lot of angels. He was a very, very religious man. So we were lucky to get this piece. It was also a time that mid-century modern was very, very important. The sleek and the rather sterile kind of furniture and the contrast of folk art was quite amazing. Think of Charles and Ray Eames' environment. It was made lively by the folk art that they had collected throughout the world. Coming out of UCLA, art department, where things were more of a formal quality to them. I was amazed by the potters. I loved the, the crudeness, actually, or the quality of the hands that came from this heavily grouted clay that was dug from rivers in Oaxaca. There were simple forms, beautiful forms, and I do to this day love those forms as well as anything I could create. I picked that up from Oaxaca. I picked up a kind of honesty of work ethic, you know. I don't know how to put it, but it was a part of their life. It wasn't really about art. It was just about who they were and what they made. And uh, I liked that. Jack Larson he invited me to participate in an exhibit in New York City. And I sent Jack a little maquette of what I was planning to do. Jack wrote back and said, no, you've got to work much bigger. People are working big in the United States. And it occurred to me that in living in, in Mexico, my work had taken on the scale of the human body. And everything I was doing was to the scale because that's sort of the intimacy that I would relate to when I would go to the village to watch the weavers. And most of my work, I hope, has that kind of echo in it. Of, of it, it really almost looks like it's from another country. Gala Getza is a Zapotec word, and it roughly, loosely, means gift giving, or reciprocity, or sharing. I also gleaned that from Oaxaca in terms of the generosity of spirit, which has to do with art and sharing your ideas with people who ask and need and all that. And it was life in Oaxaca. It was wonderful. I think there's something so healthy about some time in your life getting up and living somewhere else. 
It brought a great richness to our lives, really. And it still does. York y en París, un poco en Roma, y llegó un momento en que quería regresar al Oaxaca porque no hace tanto frío como en Europa y como en Estados Unidos. Las instituciones culturales que se han abierto 30 años hace han cambiado todo el panorama, toda la ciudad, eh, talleres, en escuelas de arte, en ver exposiciones. Cuando se empezaron a trabajar las, ¿cómo se llama? Pues todos esos proyectos, no sabíamos realmente cuál iba a ser el resultado. Pues se hizo espontáneamente, pero no se hizo con un propósito, no, no había un plan que, que pudiera dar un resultado como el que, el que se dio. Oaxaca ha really hecho un trabajo remarkable. Job. The galleries, the museums, are some of the best in the country. And it was basically the efforts of Francisco Toledo, a leading artist, and of Alejandro de Avila, who is a compadre of Francisco Toledo. And they were able to convince the city council, the politicians, of making decisions on museums and galleries rather than going the commercial kind of way. Toledo was famous for keeping a McDonald's out of the Zocalo, the city square, saying that this is the kind of thing that we do not need. Tourists do not come to have a McDonald's. They want to see Oaxaca. One of the things that Toledo did in particular was he brought over Finnish papermakers to establish a papermaking operation, but using the plants and materials that come from Oaxaca. Entonces, estos amigos finlandeses eh, habían hecho talleres para hacer papel. Y cuando vinieron a Oaxaca, propusieron montar un taller. Y lo único que teníamos que, que hacer era comprar la máquina, la pila holandesa, que está allá. Y cuando llegó, pues no sabíamos dónde poner la máquina, porque pues necesita mucha agua, necesita instalaciones eléctricas. Al final descubrimos que había este pueblo de la montaña, de donde hay mucha agua, que el agua de Oaxaca como un 30 o 40 por ciento sale de aquí. De él. Y entonces, y aquí instalamos el primer taller. Y al principio hacíamos cuadernos, hacíamos papel y poco a poco pues este, fuimos diversificando, haciendo otro tipo de trabajo, los papalotes. Y bueno, después llegó Keith y le invitamos a trabajar y bueno, desde entonces ella ha venido, no sé, una o dos veces al año a trabajar aquí a Oaxaca. Toledo asked me to design jewelry that the people working here could reproduce. And I said, oh, no, I can't possibly do that. But of course, he put that idea out there. So that's how it started. Ha sido muy benéfico para el taller porque Keith tiene muchos conocimientos, eh, sabe manejar el papel muy bien y ella regala su trabajo al taller para que el taller siga manteniéndose, siga existiendo. ¿no? Pero bueno, el resultado es muy, muy bueno, muy, muy bello. ¿no? I didn't intend to be a jeweler. I didn't regard jewelry very highly, to be frank. But my husband and I first came to Oaxaca almost 50 years ago. <laughs> At that time, we went to Monte Alban. We went very early one morning, 
and it was very calm, very peaceful, no one else there, and it was fantastic. We saw the jewelry from Tomb 7. It made a deep impression. It was the intimacy of the small scale and, and its impact that stayed with me, although it had nothing to do with, oh, I'm going to make jewelry. It's more now, I see. The seed was planted. <laughs> with this piece, I'm trying to figure out how to make the curve correct. The building was originally a hydroelectric plant in the 19th century. It's a great place for making paper since you need the water. So always you have the sound of the water here. Estoy haciendo un collar que se llama agave. Luce puesto, pues luce como tal, como un agave, abierto. Pues bueno, es bastante resistente. Todo el mundo nos pregunta qué pasa si se moja, porque es papel, pero realmente no, no pasa gran cosa. Consta de, de dos tamaños diferentes de piezas. Difiere más que nada el tamaño y el grosor del papel. Nosotros le pintamos la orilla porque le da un efecto diferente. Es como el distintivo de nuestra diseñadora de joyería, la, la orillita pintada. Nosotros cuando trabajamos con la señora aquí siempre nos platicamos mucho acerca del movimiento que debe tener la pieza. Sentimos que debe ser como parte de cada cuerpo también. Entonces siempre se ve diferente una pieza en la mesa y pues ya puesta. Ella tiene una sensibilidad increíble para crear piezas que a veces uno las ve y dice eso no puede ser una pieza de joyería, pero que ya puesta toma como vida. De Kips Lemons, en cuanto a diseñadora, yo he aprendido a que cuando yo hago una pieza de joyería, que va a hablar mucho de mí, de mi persona, de quién la hizo, ¿no? Porque cada pieza es como parte de mi identidad, de si soy cuidadosa o no, ¿no? In a way, I really was working in the beginning as a teacher of design. And this is not so much related to the way I work in metal, which is completely different. This is my Petri dish. There's no great value in any individual objects, but there's something that can happen from looking at the juxtapositions of these things. I was never attracted to the preciousness idea of jewelry, of diamonds, gold in the materials. What I valued were things that were maybe overlooked or disregarded in the culture and I began to use some of those materials. I'm often put in that place that I work with found objects, but I think in some ways I'm difficult to categorize or define within the jewelry movement. For me, it's not the technique of how I make something, but the why I make something. And if something doesn't have vitality for me, well then, there's no point. So the why is more important than how. If you really look at Chicago now, you can see how the Mexican immigrants and community have greatly affected, in a positive way, uh, the fabric of the city. One of the most important ideas that this museum has had is the concept of sin fronteras. And what that basically means is that there are no borders when it comes to culture, when it comes to community. Um, borders do not exist in the arts. The strength of artwork is that it can create bridges. It can show you what you have in common with all humanity, and it can do it in a very subtle and quiet way. 
This museum's relationship with Francisco Toledo goes way back. The museum was a year old in 1988, and we displayed the very first solo exhibition of Maestro Toledo in a museum in the United States. And it just made so much sense that we would, almost 30 years later, open our gallery doors to the more recent work of the Maestro Toledo's studios. This recent work from Casa, uh, Casa being the cultural arts center in San Agustin, outside of Oaxaca City, that was founded by Maestro Toledo and the works that are on our walls come from that space. They work felt and many other materials that are traditional, yet the way they do it is very, very contemporary. There were many hands that were a part of the creation of these works, but there was one vision, there was one mind behind it, which would have been Francisco Toledo. There was a similarity in how he set up the felt workshop to the paper workshop. Somehow he has ways of bringing out the best use of these materials in an, in an expressive way. And he has a much wider view than a single media, a single technique, a single means of expression. I think that Toledo is always seeing, looking for, making connections for his personal exploration, but also for the survival, for the vitality of the culture that he cares so much about in Oaxaca. I'm not sure he likes the term activist, but I think of him as that, as a cultural activist. La idea del taller es hacer un, también un taller que pudiera no ser contaminante, que ecológicamente pueda funcionar, haciendo muy poco daño a la naturaleza. Por otro lado, también se quiso hacer un, eh, bueno, usar los árboles, las plantas de la región para hacer papel. No solamente algodón, sino aquí hay otras plantas como el pochote, chichicasle. Hay muchas plantas en Oaxaca que pueden servir para hacer papel. ¿no? Todo tiene que ser natural. La pigmentación de, de las fibras, si tú quieres un color en especial, tiene que ser natural. E igualmente, la decoración de este tiene que ser natural, porque toda la cantidad de agua se reintegra a la red municipal, que por lo general es para consumo humano. Listo. Esto es una cooperativa. Eh, y esta cooperativa, bueno, pues este, tiene sus altibajos. A veces va bien, a veces no va bien. Pero con la ayuda de Kif y, bueno, la mía también, ha podido sobrevivir, ¿no? There are two kinds of borders. Borders in the minds and physical borders. And often it is art and artists who cross those borders and exchange way more easily than most. And to do it maybe indirectly through this very humble project gives me the opportunity to advocate for many things, really for jewelry, for art, for, for fewer borders. <laughs> 